And it was crazy because they had the Pikachu mobiles, that they had these Volkswagens that they had come, that drove all over the country, and kids were going wild. And, and about eight rows ahead of us was uh, David, David Hasselhoff and one of his kids. <laughs> and then the, I saw the first time there, uh, about, about, I don't know, about 10 or 15 minutes into the movie, one of the ushers, you know, they had uniformed ushers, because hustling down the aisle and goes in, goes in like this. Somebody was, you know, they used to do this pirating the movie, you know, they'd have a video, you know, oh, yeah. corner, <laughs> they j- take the guy out. So that, that was exciting. They're like, Hasselhoff, I told you, you <laughs> cannot record. No, it was not. I don't want to put cast aspersions on this David This is for personal use. I'd like to bring them up. First of all, um, someone who we will never give an untethered mic to, Mr. Todd Habercorn. Now, was that untethered mic experience the most unique experience out of all the panels you've ever filmed? I, I would say it was definitely up there. Then, is that bad? It's not too bad, but... Science! <laughs> Continue. Uh, we will... Did, did you want to do the rest of the intros? Because you're really... Sure! Well, who, who else do we have? We have Jonathan Ross. Jonathan? Ross. Jonathan Ross. Ladies and gentlemen, the only Jonathan you will meet in this area under the Mohegan Sun Casino roof. He comes with a J, ends with an N, and finishes his name with Ross. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Ross! It wasn't a bad experience when he had the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. Howdy. Oh, fantastic. And we have Michael uh, Hagney. Michael Hagney? Hagney? Yeah, I think that's how it's Michael Typically found as the name of the hero in most cop dramas and procedural TV shows. But his last name is anything but. (laughs) Quite unique, much like his voice, and as vast and as powerful as his resume. Michael! Hagney. Hagney! That's, that's why I bought him up first, so he could do that. He, he's a trained voice actor, so... <laughs> I love how everybody, naturally, you're, you're, you don't... It's not about... You, you're, you're group distancing. Like, everybody's been doing this since the beginning of time. You know when you go to a movie theater? And it's like, in your brain, you're like, I could sit closer. But what if there's a spontaneous fire that happens and I need to exit the building, I need to sit by the exit? Like that's, I know a lot of dads on the ends are thinking that. I can see it in their faces like he's figured us out. But I will tell you, there are prizes underneath some of these seats if you want to scoot up to the front. <laughs> just, just something to note. Some of those prizes would be used chewing gum, but you know, it, it's, it's a prize. It is a prize. And the mystery of that is you don't know what flavor until you try it. <laughs> Or which of your favorite celebrities chewed that gum? That's right. The, the mystery continues to unravel. <laughs> All right, Captain. <laughs> All night long, Rebecca Romaine's just been chewing gum and popping it under seats. It was you part of a contract. Chair. It was part of a contract, yeah. It was in the contract, yeah, I mean, sure. It's a good sport. She was like, All right, contract, contract says it. With, for instance, this is the first time that we're meeting face to face, crossing paths. I'm very curious about this. When did you first start? When was your first time in the booth for anime? Well, I, you know, I, I don't consider myself an actor, and the people who have heard my voice uh, tend to agree with that. But <laughs> I, I, I was. Uh, I was the voice of about 40 different Pokemon on the original Pokemon TV series and the movies and and the games. And I was originally hired to adapt the scripts and to direct the actors. And so at the beginning of the series, we knew very little about Pokemon. We knew there were 150 Pokemon. We had 52 episodes. We knew that Pikachu from the first episode was probably going to be in every episode. And so uh, we would schedule the actors for two hours, and if, we, if they finished in an hour and 45 minutes, I would jump in the booth and say, char, 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 or say, aye, aye, or say that. So I am atypical in, in this. If these are actually actors. I uh, acted, but I do not, ca- I, if you call it acting, uh, but I, I don't consider myself an actor. And actually, I never got paid for... Um, <laughs> 
and, and for uh, sounds like in one voice because I was on salary. Although one time we did a commercial and a lot of the things, and that was a good payday. But only they never did that again. I was gonna say email to Tom and Lisa. Oh wait, can't. okay, delete, save draft. Okay, cool. And then for uh, yourself, yeah. yeah, for me, I, I was sort of fresh out of school. Um, I, I went to school for uh, for theater, and uh, you know, I was 22, and I was just like any job was like a great job, and. Uh, through someone at my school, they were like, send us three guys to audition for Ultraman, um, which was, you know, not, it was live action, uh, live action dub. And I, I booked the job that day, you know, I auditioned that morning and was doing the job in the afternoon. And it was like, oh, wait, I'm a, like, I'm a voiceover actor now, I guess. <laughs> uh, and, you know, like those things work like the director from Ultraman. I did a few different episodes of Ultraman, just little side characters and stuff. And then, uh, you know, months go by and then he called up and he was like, hey, I'm working on this show called Yu-Gi-Oh! I had no idea what it was. He was like, you know, come in and audition for it. And, um, you know, so that first job led to certainly to the second job. And then, you know, especially starting out as a, a young actor, it, it, you know, work legitimizes you. It maybe shouldn't, but like it often does. And so, you know, once I had that going for me, it led to a voiceover agent. It led to my first audiobook. And like, even though they're so not, you know, the voice I did on Yu-Gi-Oh would be a really terrible, you know, chapter one. Like, you know, it's the long 10 hours with that guy. But like that first job led to so many other jobs. Uh, you know, now uh, it's, audiobooks are all I do. And, um, you know, that's, it, it's certainly that first, that first anime job was responsible for like so many things that happened. Well, right now, as every waking minute, you're thinking of the deadline that you have coming up for your that audiobook. Is, that is exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Um, I think also one thing that is different now than it was uh, back then is that the industry is not like that anymore. So mm -hmm. you can't, so many times I'm sure you all uh, get this as well. People are like, well, how do you bust in? How do you get started? You can't do it the same way that it was because now the whole industry uh, has, there's this um, content, uh, quantity over quality aspect to the content. So it's not even about, so many times I've been on panels where people are like, you need to get training, you need to, and, and that would be awesome if that were the actual case. But if you think about it, it, it doesn't even matter in terms of, and I say this in terms of giving you, give every, everybody, everybody has more uh, hope and chances than than you did back in the day because I think now because there's so much content that needs to get done, it's not really, honestly, it sounds bad, it's not even about talent, it's not even about how good you are. Because if you think about it, and I've said this before, is McDonald's the best burger in the world? No. Yet billions and billions have been sold, right? So what does that tell you? It's not about being the best burger. <laughs> if you're just a burger that's available, someone will come and take a bite. So that's what, because, it, it, right? How many burger places are around this area? So many, you just said it. And they all have a home in someone's tummy, right? So that's the thing about, about the industry now is I feel like there's so many opportunities that there is something out there for everybody. And so it's just, it's different than it was back. Like back in when I auditioned for Funimation or I worked with Tom on Pokemon or um, with audiobooks, uh, there was, they had to search under every piece of thing for people to come in and, you know, and do it. Funimation now has a roster of over a thousand actors. The wait list is eight years long. When I was doing it, they're like, please God, I saw you, I saw you talking to someone in a supermarket, so I know you can talk. Can you please come talk behind a mic? It was like that. Audiobooks, they would put ads in the paper and like, have you ever read a book before? Do you know what words are? Are you literate? We need you. And they would bring you in to narrate these books uh, because they needed that. But now it's like, you, you, everywhere you turn, someone wants to get into VO. Like when I'm driving with, in the car, um, you know, sometimes I, I set the Uber, I'll be like, no conversation, please. I'm, I'm good, I'm good. But they're like, where are you headed? I'm like, Burbank, you know, wh what you doing over there? Going to a studio, huh? What you doing in that studio? Voiceover? Well, guess what? And then they're like, they, their demo flies into my hand. 
<laughs> and so it's, it's very, um, so that's why I just tell people that I'm a contractor. I just do construction. Because <laughs> when they look at me, they go, I see construction. <laughs> so I don't know. I feel like that's kind of the way it's mm-hmm. molded into and changed, you know? So, so, Todd, though, you have not explained your first time in the recording booth. My first experience recording? Well, my... So, uh, for, for me, my problem was that I grew up in an Asian family. You know, my, my mom is uh, Vietnamese, and we immigrated over here, and so her work ethic is like, if you think AI is mechanical and methodical and systematic, AI has not met my mother. <laughs> so when I told her I wanted to go into the entertainment industry, I mean, you could hear, you know, that Prince wrote a song about when doves cry. No, when my mom cries, when she hears I want to go into that industry. So she has this work ethic to where it's like I had to always be doing something. So I did uh, VO, I did directing, I did engineering, writing for uh, stage, for animation, anime, audiobooks, movies, television series, radio, all of that stuff. I wore every single hat. Not because when I was a kid, I, when I was a little toddler, I wanted to be an actor. But then I was like, I did all these other things because I wanted to, deep down, I wanted to make mom happy, which we all want to make our moms happy, right? Even though we say we don't want to, really deep down, that's what you want to do. And so you go through therapy and work that out. Uh, And so that's why I did all of those things. Uh, And so my very first experience in VO, I had already been acting for, by that point, 20-something years. And so, uh, which is weird, because I'm only 23. But, uh, so when I got behind the mic, it was for a show called Peach Girl, was my very first anime. I don't remember the episode, I don't remember the character's name, I don't remember where I come in in that episode that I can't remember, but I was in there. And then from there, I was waiting for security to kick me out, they didn't, they said, that's not bad, let's do it again, and then here we are. Well, that is awesome. It's, it's a way of life. It is a path <laughs> that I have chosen. It's a good path, and we're glad you're on it. Stay, stay on that path. Stay on that. My mom, I think, has finally come around. <laughs> has she ever watched any episode of anything that you've done? Begrudgingly, I forced her to go see a movie. We did this show called Fairy Tale, and we did a movie that was in theaters the same week as my birthday. It was, it was in theaters from here to you know, everywhere in between. Uh, all nine inches of the U.S. map, it was in theaters. I always think of maps and distances as like on a map. So when people are like, I'm in New York, I'm like, oh, that's only eight inches. That's a quick trip. Uh, but for, so fairy tale was in theaters, and I was like, Mom, I have a movie in theaters right now. Can you make time to go see it? And she's like, we'll see, son. I have a lot to do. And I'm like, well, can one of those things that you're doing be seeing your only child in a movie, in a theater? So she goes. And then when you go to the theater, when, you're, when your mom goes to see something that you're doing, what do you expect after, afterwards? That Good she job, son. <laughs> calls you and tells you something. It was like 9 o'clock at night. I hadn't heard from my mom. Showing was like at noon. I thought in my head, well, maybe she's watching it six times. <laughs> I call her, I go, Mom, what are you doing? She goes, I'm at home, son, tending to my garden. It's not 1800s, what are you doing tending to your garden at 9 o'clock at night? And so I said, did you go see the movie? And she's like, yes, I I did. (laughs) What did you think? It's not my cup of tea, son, but you were good. (laughs) So I count that as a win. So that's the one thing she's seen of mine. That is awesome. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, 23 years old. So, so Michael, you do a lot more directing. Um, I did. You did? I did, yeah. Uh, after, po- after Pokemon, because I worked at four kids that had a lot of these shows at that time. And so after Pokemon, uh, I did a couple hundred episodes of that and the movies. And then um, I went on to Kirby, which I think was two seasons. It's such a long time ago, and everything runs together. And then after that, I did Sonic X. And then we did an original series called Chaotic that was for three seasons. And then a, a show that I liked, it adapted. Chaotic was an original show, but uh, it was called Tai Chi Chasers. And it, uh, it was a fun show. And uh, it, it, the first season was a cliffhanger. And I never found out what happened to, <laughs> to Kai or anything. So if, if you know, uh, write to me. 
Yeah, well, somebody look that up on the internet quick. But uh, so dealing with various personalities, I, I, some voice actors can be um, very quiet, and some are not. But but that's not not a bad thing. There's a lot of different personalities. Managing those personalities as a director, were there were there certain challenges or? Uh, yeah, mostly mostly around lunch. Because, you know, with certain people that you knew you not to schedule around our break for lunch because we would go all day in like an eight hour day recording. And some people like kind of lingered at lunch. So we had to knew, know certain actors would go more quickly than others. But it is a little bit of psychology. I mean, uh, you know, as directing, uh, you know, you're you know, you get to know each person's personality and you know uh, how much time, you know, it's also a scheduling issue because you know how much time we had kind of a formula of how long how long each line would take. But then we would have a factor, uh, a variable in there, depending on the actor. And also, if, if the longer an actor goes, you get tired, or if it's a voice that's particularly challenging. I'm sure, you've dealt with this. That you got to kind of learn to schedule less time, uh, you know, you know, for e each one of those things. But there, there is a little psychology. I was always lucky because um, the actor, I, I, you know, the, the, the cliche of the temperamental or difficult actor really didn't, really didn't uh, happen. Uh, you know, you, as the director. I'm sure you've been on both sides of this where you say, oh, let's do one more for safety. And actually, that first one was very safe, but you didn't like it for some reason. And <laughs> so you had to learn to, um, I don't want to say criticize, but guide. That's, you know, directing, you know. And so I, I, it was a process for me to learn, and uh, I hope I learned it, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> I have a question for you both. So for Jonathan and Michael, when you've gotten to the point in your career where you're at, and you've done so many things, and the 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 laundry list is like when someone says like, oh, tell me the top things you work on. You pause, not because you didn't expect the question, but because you have so many things to comb through, which is an awesome place to be. And, and rarefied air, really, to, to be in the, it's, because you've done so much, it doesn't seem like that, but it definitely is. Do you ever get to a place where when someone sends you an audition or someone asks you for, you know, a sample of something, do you, do you get to the place where you're like, I've done 500 things. If you don't know what I can do by this point, or do you feel like, great, happy to, happy to? Um, so for, I, I'd love to answer that question. Uh, you know, like I said, mostly right now it's, it's audiobooks, and it's a very, it's a very like, it's a very like, in all of the acting world, it's kind of a very blue collar job in the sense of, like you said, like there's a deadline, and especially nowadays, like you're working solo and you sit at your, you know, you your computer and your microphone and you record a book at your own pace. And he only gets credited for narration. They won't credit him for directing it, <laughs> for providing the myself, space, right. engineering it. No. You just get it for narration. That's exactly right. And guess what? The credits are free. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and so, but so the, the, you know, to that point, I never actually mind, like it still happens where like if an, if an author has approval of, um, you know, the, the, you know, they want to, they have to approve the narrator. And like, sometimes they want to hear like their book read. And I'm never, I'm never like personally offended by it. Cause like you feel competitive and you're like, well, you know, like, all right, I got this. But like, I'm actually, actually not such a great auditioner. And so like, I'm like, oh, can't they just like search me on Audible and like listen to like one of like the 400 books I've done. So it's more about like, oh shit, when they ask me, sorry, when they ask me to audition where, where I'm like, oh man, I hope I get this job as opposed to when I know I'm just being like submitted directly that I'm actually going to have a much better chance of, of them being like, hey, you got the job. Um, but you know, secretly there's always probably a part of me that's like, you're asking me to audition, but like I don't really feel that way. But there's a tiny secret part of my brain where I'm like, don't you know who I am? And the answer is no. But like, still. Well, know? but I mean, like, it, it'd be like going to it'd be like going to your your mom or your grandma's house, and they've made stellar meals for decades, and then you're like, Ma, do you know how to cook? She'd right. slap the shit out of you. Mm. <laughs> because she's cooked for you hundreds of times. Right. <laughs> I guess. Maybe? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think, you know. How many people have not heard the word shit before? <laughs> right, <sorry. laughs> Anybody? Then we're good. Okay, okay, sorry about that. I won't say shit again. <laughs> if you haven't heard it. Well, how do you feel about it? If, if that happens to you? Um, for me, abso oh, absolutely. For every audition I get, for, for every one I book, just for me, my ratio, my KD ratio is terrible. 
For every audition that I book, there's like a thousand that I don't book. And that's just, I'm used to rejection. And the reason I was so good at rejection, accepting, is because when I would ask people out on dates, I got rejected a lot. So I was like, it's natural to want to go into acting because I'm already getting rejected. Um, but yeah, no, there's a little bit of a, it's not that, it's, it's like with what you're saying. It's, uh, it's a little bit of, I think a lot of times, you, there, there's a um, facade where it's like, Oh, I never watch the stuff I do. I just can't stand to watch myself. I just, I, um, you know, it's, uh. but no, I watch stuff. When I do stuff, I want to watch it because I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I could have done that better. Um, I wish they would have gone with the first take on that. Why didn't they do, you know, I think about stuff like that. So when you hear actors say they don't watch their stuff, they're lying to you. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I do feel that away a little bit of like, I've done, I've done five things with two more zeros behind it. Can't you just look at a few of those? But then also it's like, it's the same thing you're saying. It's like, I do want to audition because maybe in that audition process, I'll find something where I'm like, oh, I haven't tried that before. Or maybe I don't typically get to display that side of a vocal quality that I feel like I might be able to offer. So it's an opportunity to, to hey, I, I can do that. Let me show you that I can do that. Um, and so it's a, it's a give and take, mm -hmm. I feel like, depending on where they catch you in the day of if you've had your coffee or not. Right. If I've had my coffee, then I'm like, let's audition for all the things. If I haven't, I'm like, God damn it. So just give me that I think job. it just depends. Give me yeah. that job. <laughs> but like for, for writing, it's because you were primarily writing, directing? Right. I, I had worked in television, in, in, in other kind of television before I got into animation, you know, adapting the scripts and and directing the shows completely fluky way, you know? Yeah. So th these kind of things, don't, you know, as I said, I'm not an actor. I did voices, but I never went out as an actor. You know, I had been a produ TV producer before that. So it's, it's kind of a different thing. But being sort of on the other side of it, you know, everybody, you started to, you, you touched on it before, you know, everybody wants to hire somebody, even if they really like them, they like an insurance policy. They like to see that 10 other companies have hired you because then if you're good, they take the credit for if you're good then I take the credit. I hired him I, I knew he was going to be great and if you if it doesn't turn out well I'll say well hey they did Funimation had they had him I don't know I don't know what happened to him you know you blame you can blame somebody else yeah. either implicitly or explicitly everybody I think who hires a person it's like that's why they have resumes because a person hiring a person wants to see that somebody else hired him and that's why it's so hard to break in uh -huh. it, it, but if you can break in and have show as you were saying other people that you've done something because they're not going to check how well you did. And the other person's not allowed to lie. They, they're not allowed to, you know, squash your career legally. They don't want to say you were terrible. Yeah. Uh, and so they say, well, I'll tell another person. Dude. So that's why I always tell young actors who, who ask me, uh, just try to get hired by anybody and as many people as you can, because then you have a resume and then another person can say, other people hired you, then I feel safer hiring you. And yeah. I would imagine within that there's also a an implied standard of professionalism, right. especially in a, in a job that's sort of, you know, time is money. Like we got, right. you know, you can ha we have an hour of time to get this done. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard people in the elevator have a great voice and it's like, but they may not be able to act. And, and so maybe I may missed a great opportunity to, to help someone have a career. But unless someone else, if they, they may have a fantastic voice, they may be able, but if they show, don't show up on time or they ignore, you know, deadlines and then things like that, then I, we can't use them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have, do either of you have a memorable, for good or bad reasons, your, like a memorable moment in the biz that comes to mind that you reference when people are like, what's the best thing that's ever happened? The worst thing that's ever happened? Do you have like one that sticks out for you? Other than this panel. I have oh. a, I have a uh, uh, <laughs> not, probably not in the way you mean, but I, I you know, I, uh, a uh, long time ago would also do, you know, theater and would audition for film and TV stuff. Uh, and I did a uh, job on Guiding Light where I had a kissing scene with a lovely uh, woman who eventually became my wife. Hey! So, like, wow. it's, my, it's like a very easy, like, memorable, <laughs> that, you know, it's like, I love you, Candace. I love you, Tommy. And like, oh, wow. now, and neither of us are doing that, you know, we're not, you know, consider yeah. ourselves actors that way anymore. <laughs> or you're not like, kissing anymore. We're still kissing. Oh, the, kiss, the kissing's going great. For a Don't let anyone tell you differently. <laughs> now, well, you was that, that kiss the audition? Was that like the kiss on the show? Was that the audition for, you know, okay. <laughs> it sort of, <laughs> it, it, it did sort of feel that way, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> so beforehand, were there like, were you, were you already digging her and she was digging you? It was kind of like from there it spurred. Uh, yeah, we, so <laughs> this is fun. So, we, you know, we were, it was a long day on set and I was like, got there at 10 AM and like, they didn't end up shooting our scene until like six. Yeah. But so like, I spent like the first five hours of the day in a uh, dressing room with like the two guys who were playing like the mafia toughs. So they were like <laughs> running lines with me. So they were like, Tommy, like, I love you so much. And like, so it was this all day. And then finally, like, so meaning what he means is like the, uh, his other scene partners lines, they're helping him with his right, memorization. They're helping me run so, my memorization. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, uh, you know, then eventually my wife did come in and she was like, Oh, are you playing Tommy? And then the, you know, she was like, I'd love to run lines. And so like we ran lines, uh, for a long time before we went on. Set. <laughs> I was like, and then when you were on set, you're about to kiss the mafia guy that was helping. Right. was like, hey, let me give that right. a shot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Scoot over, lady. Okay. I got this. Well, very cool. How long ago is that? How long have you been together now? 60. It'll be 16 years this week that we... That we Fantastic. Had, uh, so do, what, what's the big plan at this point when, you've, when, you've had, when you have 15 other anniversaries on the 16th? Do you have tricks up your sleeve still? Uh, the trick's going to be remembering which day it actually was. <laughs> like, yes. I don't and being like, oh, yeah, today was a day. And we go, oh, great. Let's who's picking up the kids. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then what about yourself, Michael? Like some... I, I guess I, related to this, because, uh, you know, you work on the shows and you do them out of order and you, they, they get go out there either uh, broadcast or cable or on a tape. So, you don't. I, I never had any contact with the fans of, of Pokemon, especially there were a lot at the beginning. You know, we knew this show was a, a big hit, but... You know, you see car, kids playing cards or in the subway or whatever. But um, after we did the first movie, they had a premiere at uh, Grauman's Chinese, but I guess it was Man's Chinese Theater at that time. And, uh, you know, I knew it was going to be a premiere, and I had never been to the inside the theater. And so we got there, and it was crazy because they had the... Pikachu mobiles that they had these Volkswagens that they had come that drove all over the country and kids were going wild and you know the, so the lights go we get in there and the lights go down and the, the, the logo pops up and the place went wild it was really crazy yeah. and that was a good feeling and about eight rows ahead of us was uh, David, David Hasselhoff and one of his kids <laughs> and then the, I saw the first time there uh, about, about I don't know about 10 or 15 minutes into the movie one of the ushers you know they had uniformed ushers because hustling down the aisle and goes in goes in like this somebody was you know they used to do this pirating the movie you know they'd have a video you know oh, yeah. corner, <laughs> they take the guy out so that, that was exciting they're like Hasselhoff I told you you <laughs> cannot it record no, it was not I don't want to put cast aspersions on David Hasselhoff use but what about for you oh gosh um uh i think it was you know the the beautiful thing is that when you can have those little snapshots in your brain that you that no one can you know icloud can't delete them because they're just in your head they're little memories that you may not have a picture of but you still remember the feeling you have that light bulb memory of it um i think for me it was it was the decision when it was time to go into voiceover full time. So I'd, I'd been an actor and I went to college and for theater, like yourself. Uh, but then my mom's voice was in my head and, and I was hearing like, you need to have a steady job. But I was already working. I was in Barney. I was Mr. Knickerbocker and Barney and uh, hey, Mr. Knickerbocker. Boppity bop. I like the way that you Boppity bop. That's my Shatner version. Um, and so I was, I was a teacher. I taught theater right out of college. Terrible idea. I shouldn't have done that because I was exhausted from being on set all day. And then I would have to go teach during the day. And so I remember walking down the hall and I had just started doing voiceover and it was picking up momentum. And so I was at a, at a crossroads where I was like, I need to either commit to going VO or commit to teaching because I, I can't do both, obviously, and I'm kind of doing the kids a disservice because I'm so exhausted. I used up all my sick, my principal hated me. I used up all my sick days in like the first, first shoot. First shoot was like, what, a month? And so I'm like, I'm using all seven of my sick days in like the first week. And so I remember walking down the hall in between classes and there was a teacher coming and he'd been there 30 something years teaching. Great teacher, established, tenured. He was going to be there until he didn't want to be. And I remember the look on his face when he's walking down the hall of just utter defeat. And just, and he had, a, he had, he was set. This job, career set, insurance, blah, blah, life, all, everything good. But that energy when he was walking down the hall, 
I, I made my decision right there. I'm, go I'm, I'm done, I'm going into VO. And so I told the administration I'm gonna leave. And I was only there for like a year and a half by this point. I was young, you know, like I said, see, I'm 23 now, so, so like, uh, you know, I was 11 when I was teaching. Uh, and so they send in the, the district administrator and she's like, I think you're a lifer. I think you're gonna be a teacher forever. <laughs> that scared the, remember that word I was talking about earlier? That scared the shit out of me. And so, uh, yeah, that was a light bulb moment for me. And it's a little thing that, how do you take a picture of that? Mm -hmm. you, you don't. That would be strange to go back and walk down the hall of morose again. <laughs> like, you know, so, but, but that moment really stuck out, I think, for me. But yeah. So again, does anyone have any questions? We have a microphone right over here. And if, excellent. Because I have a question for you before you ask your question. OK. Tell me your least favorite cereal. Least favorite cereal. Um, this is a hard one. Probably the mini wheats, frosted mini wheats. Oh. You don't like frosted mini wheats? Not really, no. Are you okay? <laughs> Those are delicious. Sorry, just... I guess you can ask your question now. Thank you for your candor. Who likes those? Of course. Um, my name is Colin. I was going to ask um, was voice acting something I find really cool? It just, um, like, how you could play all different types of characters. It's like not limited by like how you look or anything. And I was wondering for all of you, like, what's it like? How do you feel like playing different types of characters, different like, or different like types of Pokemon? Like, <laughs> how does that, I don't know, like what's your favorite part of that, I guess? Well, Jonathan, I'm sharing your novel right now. You're playing about 30 different characters. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. It, yeah, they're all talking to each other. <laughs> I have a list of like, where it's like, this guy's from Australia, I guess. Like, <laughs> run out of voices after a while yeah. out of these books. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, that's the fun of it, right? Like, the fun, and you know, I think to, to some extent, when you end up in the arts, you're always starting from a place of some weirdness. And like, I never, uh, you know, I never like intended specifically to be a voice actor, but like I had, since I was a kid, I would do voices and like make my parents laugh and then make my friends laugh. And then like when I got the job, especially when I got the job as like a cartoon bad guy, where I was like, oh right, this was always my dream. Like I didn't realize that like, you know, I was heading towards a place of you know, wanting to be, wanting to play in that way of like, just with my voice as a tool and make funny voices and get paid for it. And like, especially at four kids, I think part of the fun was being able to like, you know, it's a little less Willy Wonka-esque than it sounds, but about like going into the Yu-Gi-Oh room and then like, you know, going into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles room and like you would, there was this sense of like, what's gonna happen today? And then they're like, here's the character like, you know, or to show it on the screen, be like, ah, oh, there's that guy. He only has like four lines and you'd have to be like, yeah, okay, go. Um, <laughs> so fun for me. I don't know. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, for, for, maybe not acting necessarily, yeah, but, I, but. I'm not an actor. I looked into it. I cast myself as the Pokemon. And so it, was it fun? <laughs> you know, it was, it, at the time I was adapting the scripts too. So it was a, it was a real, you know, race to the deadline because the broadcast deadlines were hard. You know, it wasn't like something that came out on on on, on DVD or, or something that you know maybe they could push back. So it was just trying to get through those scripts and just trying to get through those recording sessions to get them mixed and out. So um, I don't know, but I, I I guess I could have a better answer. But the whole thing about the mini weeds just threw me off. I'm sorry. I'll give them another try. It's been a while. Them. They're, they're, that's a good cereal. I, I don't. <laughs> Thank you for considering frosted mini wheats again. Um, for me, it's it's a, like just last week, for example, midweek. I looked at my my day for what I'm going to record, and so the morning started off as um, uh, I was doing like a, like an elf king from a like a Lord of the Rings universe, and then the afternoon was what was the session like a old man like a sensei in a video game. And then after that was, <laughs> I'm the voice of this Bible app. 
I don't know why they thought of it, but like, they, like every now and then I'll get an email from them and like, hey, we've got three months of this app update we need you to do. And so like in one day. And so it is fun to be able to do that because for me, being an on-camera actor and, and an on-stage performer before VO, um, I had many times, it's just so funny to me as a, as a mix, because I'm a mixed breed. Like, like I don't fit in one, like I've been told this by agents, like I'll go sit in with a commercial agent, I was represented with one in uh, Hollywood, and they go, they literally have charts about this stuff, and they go, you are not blonde haired and blue eyed, so you actually will not do well in these commercials, and they point to the chart, and they go, you would not do well, and I'm not offended by it, because remember my mom, hard ass? I'm not offended by it. She survived the, the Vietnam War, so it's like, Mom, I got offended by this chart. She's going to be like, son, let me slap the shit out of you and get to the dinner table. Like, I get it. And also, I was the only Asian kid in my theater department. The only one for four years. It's okay. Didn't bug me. It's all right. I knew how to use chopsticks. They didn't. And so, uh, so I had, I've been told by other agents that, we, that they literally sit me down and they go, we don't know what to do with your look. And so again, I'm like, dang, that didn't, that just made me, that gave me motivation to try harder and to build those characters that, that weren't me so that I could try to embody something that would fit. And so I took it as a great challenge. I feel like I became a, a, a little detective. That's what I love about these roles that aren't you, is that you go in and you investigate what's their life like? Where did they come from? What, uh, I, when I played, um, uh, what poet did I play? Uh, oh, famous poet. Um, I'll remember it when the panel's over. I remember going to London and I was walking through Westminster Abbey and I, I stood right on his grave. Not like viciously, but I was like, oh, that's that guy I played. But, but learning about their ailments and, and how they grew up and embodying that was, is so, that's so magnetic for me that I love that we get to do that in VO. And then the better part of that is that we don't have to look like them. We can still be these characters that aren't us in this other realm and apparently still go do a Bible app at the end of the day. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that's been fun. Can we hear the Bible app voice? Yeah. Okay. So let me, so it's something like this. When you really look at the Bible, it's, you, there's no messing around in there. It was like, um, <laughs> he stole four cups of water and when he returned to his home, the Lord had smote his entire village, and he watched as his children burned in the fire. Psalms 2, 7 through 14. Like, and stuff like that in this thing. And so, I'm like, okay. Save, file send. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I apologize about the mini weeds. Yeah, I think it. <laughs> apologize. Don't, 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 don't apologize for being you. It's fine. <laughs> Before you ask your question, if your house were on fire right now and you had to grab one thing to save, what would it be? Can't you? I can't grab just one thing. Cause it's got to be one thing. But I have all my animals to save. <laughs> I'll, I'll, because I love animals, I'll count all the animals as one. No, pick entity. one animal. Oh, no, you got to pick one animal. <laughs> Who's no. your favorite? And you have to look the others in the eye as you take that one animal. Right. <laughs> my family can take cool. all the other animals, so I'll take my cat. Okay. 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 So you take your cat and your, your dad's like, honey, help me. And you're like, I can't. I can only take one thing. Wow. Okay. Harsh. All right. Now I, I take my mask off. I'm your dad. I'm like, that was a test. Uh, what's your question? Um, do you have a favorite? Do you, um, do you have a favorite character that you voiced or like a few that stand out? Um, out of all of them? A favorite character that you voice and a favorite character you've written for? Well, uh, my favorite voice was Sign, Knock, Knock, Sign, Knock, Knock, Sign. That's, <laughs> that's my friend's favorite Pokemon. I've hey! Heard. Well, where's your friend? Uh, they got caught in a fire, maybe. No! <laughs> 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 yeah, you're standing there with your cat. <laughs> favorite character? Uh, you know, the, the, certainly the one that led to the most, you know, that, that loomed the largest for me was Marek on Yu-Gi-Oh! and banishing people to the Shadow Realm. And, uh, you know, that, I think the, the uh, uh, that would be, yeah, that would be the one. Um, lots of them have been fun, but that one meant the most to me, and it also destroyed my voice. <laughs> That's nice. But it was worth it. Um, I would say Sergeant Frog. 
Carrero was one of my favorites. I love the fact that he enjoyed chores so much and still wanted to rule over Pico Pond, also known as Earth. That was fun. Frog. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck with the house fire. <laughs> we have about ten minutes left, so let's not try to... This is way too high. <laughs> you, you know what? You can take that mic, you can lower it down, or teamwork. And then while you're doing that, I want you, you to think of the answer to this question before you ask your question. Okay. What is one meal that when you sit down and you see it before you, all is right with the world? My mom's stuffed shells. Yeah, okay. All right. How long does she take to make them? Mm, probably about two hours. Ah, a lot of love in there. Yeah. Okay, good stuff. What's your question? So she actually stole my question, but <laughs> now nah, I came up with a new one. So what is the most difficult character you have ever voiced for? Most difficult character? Or written for. Mm. <laughs> That's difficult. <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> All right, I'll, 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 I'm sorry. I guess the ones yeah. that strain your voice, you know, the ones that strain your voice. I think with Pokemon, it was it wasn't so much a difficult uh, character, but if you had uh, an episode or a couple episodes where they they had a lot of reacts, there were a lot of battles and that kind of stuff, and like it's like at these conventions, I you know people come up and I do char char char, you know, and but by Sunday I'm like char char char, you know, like a smoker's <laughs> thing. So I think it would be not one particular character, but a character who did a lot in that particular episode. Yeah. Right, or, or one that put a particular strain on their voice. Like, so Marek, if anyone has not seen Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, Marek was evil, but then inside him there was a super evil version of Marek, like Probably double Marek, evil, yeah. and I had no idea, you know, you don't get the scripts ahead of time, so like, I, for a year I've been like, Shadow Realm, I'm going to banish you to the Shadow Realm, and then they're like, now we need something, he's oh. double evil. And like all I could think, in, and it's not like time to be like, oh, go away for an hour and like come back without. They were like, well, no, go. And like, so then the only thing I could think was to make like everything that was hard about it a lot worse. So it went from like Shadow Realm to like Shadow Realm. And then it was like, now you're doing that voice yeah. for the next like four months. Yeah, oh, um, and then when you would come back, that, we'd come back to the original voice, then it would be like a vacation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You'll have to be my answer. Yeah, they're, they're like similar type of thing in, in World of Warcraft. They, they would be when I would play these orcs that are, that are like that. There's like one orc leader that, that would pop up in each DLC. And um, the, the, it's so interesting because like the director, they're so nice and they try to accommodate and they're like, do you want to take like 15? And I go, 15 minutes isn't going to help this. <laughs> and so I was like, let's just keep going. But it's stuff like that. Whenever you're, whenever you do a little, uh, you know, you do your rosaries for your vocal cords, that's when you know it's going to be hard. <laughs> I, I worked on this game called Rage, um, where from the guys that made Doom. And when I went in, uh, this was back in the day when I had no boundaries for myself and no boundaries for my, my work-life balance. And so I was like, sure, yeah, um, jump off the platform, down the cheese grater into a vat of vinegar and impale myself. Great, got it, let's do it. Like, just, I would do anything. And so I was in the booth for this and it was a lot of that down here yelling, like that, but yelling it, right? And so I would do it and I clearly can hear that I'm losing my voice. Like, it does, those sessions don't go super long. And so I'm losing it, and, and, I, and I, you know, it's painful. And, uh, and instead of saying stop, I'm like, let's keep going. And so I keep going, I keep up sweat, I'm drenched, I'm like, take the shirt off, it's so hot in there. It was a weird day, because I was like, it was in, this was in Texas, their studios were in Texas. And so I'm recording so hot in the booth, and they've got a camera right there. And I go, hey, this might sound weird, but I am like freezing because I'm sweating, and it's so cold in the booth that I'm like, I don't want to get sick. So I was like, can I record topless? And they're like, you saw the engineer take his thinking, talking. Yeah, I guess so, because it was freezing. I needed to take my freezing shirt off because I was sweating at the same time that the heat was coming. So that's already weird, and then I'm losing my voice, and I didn't want to say, can I take a, uh, look at the guy who, who has to do temperature control in the booth, now he wants to take a break, and I didn't want to be that guy. So after I recorded the, the show, the video game, I lost my voice for nine and a half days straight. 
could not whisper. When I would whisper, nothing would come out. And I thought, well, this is it. My mom was right. She, she made this game to trick me into this moment so that I would have to go become a doctor or a lawyer like she wanted. <laughs> and so then years later, Rage 2 comes out. I get called in. <laughs> And apparently they had had a big discussion right before I came in about how, hey, we need to be real good to these actors, like don't, don't push their voice, don't. But I didn't know that. So I go into the session, I go, oh, oh, this is Rage 2. I go, funny story. And I told them about Rage 1. They did not find that amusing because they just had this conversation about how they weren't supposed to do that. And so to make that even weirder is we're recording in the booth and, I, and again, I'm yelling, all, I'm, my voice is getting blown out. Well, the, I'm telling them like my voice is blown out. So the engineer has his finger on the button so that, so that I can hear into the booth where the clients are and things like that. And they're saying, yeah, his voice is thrashed, what do we do? And the client didn't know that the finger was on the button. He goes, just push it, just try to push him through it, let's just get it done. And then he, I saw the recognition, and the, the, it's just a silent, and you hear, unclick. <laughs> it was awesome. So that was the most hard voice to do, but yet the most fun in some ways. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, Italy would love my mom's pasta. Oh, I love it! Yay! <laughs> the question that I have to ask you before you ask your question. Oh, I fell for your track card, didn't I? What was your very first convention? Actually, it was a really easy one. Anime Boston. Fantastic. That was my first convention. 2008. That was my very first convention. What's your question? Okay. First of all, Merrick, your Egyptian god card will belong to me. We'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, so my name's Eddie Lesdowski. I'm from uh, Mombro, New Hampshire. We actually saw each other yesterday, actually. <laughs> um, I'm actually trying to kind of sum it to one question because I'm hoping maybe you can get a shot. Um, a big question for all of you. Is there ever a time you know, when you're doing a voice for so long, like for example, for, you know, for your voice for Barrack, is, does there ever get a point where you start to worry about everybody thinking that you sound like that every single day, 24 seven? Like for example, like, do you think that you know, as soon as you get out of bed, do you think everybody you know, thinks that you're saying, like, oh, I'm having some bacon for breakfast. <laughs> or I've got to do some laundry. Or honey, I'm home. He can't um, turn, you can't turn the character off. Right, that I wouldn't be able exactly. to turn it. You know, I, The only people who have that fear are my children who go, stop making voices, daddy. <laughs> so don't make funny voices. But, um, uh, but no, it's never, it's never been like a real, a real worry that, it was more like we were talking about the vocal strain. It's more about like, oh my God, I have two hours of this tomorrow and I don't know if I'm going to make it. Um, that's, that's, I would say, the bigger worry. I hope you get stuck in a voice, though. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> don't, you don't get stuck in a voice, though. Only he gets to. That's it. I have a question for you before you ask your question. Where's the furthest you've traveled in the world? Say that again. The furthest, the furthest you've traveled in the world. I gotta say, the furthest I've ever traveled will have to be the Dominican Republic. How long were you there? About a week. Vacation? Wedding. Wedding? Your wedding? No. <laughs> Part of the wedding that you wanted to stop? I was the friend of a friend. Did you want to stop the wedding? It would have been funny to stand up and do that, but I did not. <laughs> Are they still together today? Yes. Excellent. What's your question? My question is, have you ever learned a valuable, a valuable lesson from a character that you played, whether it be through the character itself or playing the character? No. <laughs> I like that succinct answer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, look, the, I, the message of Yu-Gi-Oh was always pretty simple and I think pretty, uh, uh, pretty universal of always, always trusting your friends. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's a pretty nice message. Um, I think for me, when I was doing Ben 10, the message was evil wins for about 11 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most valuable lesson. So don't be evil. Don't be evil. And don't try to break up your friends' weddings unless you think 
Unless you think you got a real shot and it's a good reason you're doing it. Like if you discover something bad about one or the other. He loves frosted wheats. Yeah. Then you need to break no, that wedding up. This. Okay. Thank you for your question. Guys, this has been great. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out Thank of time. You. But big round of applause for, for Michael, Jonathan, and my co-moderator over there, Todd. He, he's the best co-moderator. <laughs> a round of, round of applause for our main moderator. Good job, good job. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. This is Erica Harlicker Stone, and you're watching a Fandom Spotlight. Yay! Make sure to like and subscribe. Do it. Do it right now. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. I don't know why you aren't doing it. Seriously, I'm going to keep saying it until you do it. Ugh. Okay, thank you. Yay. Remember to have fun and follow your fandom. Bye.